avoid that this morning. All right, turn with me, if you would, uh, to Isaiah 7, 14. While you're turning there, uh, let me once again just say how much last night, ladies, I'm telling you, you just outdid yourself. You all had a good time. Uh, the, the guys and I were sitting up there. We were uh, kind of getting ready to eat the leftovers. That's what we get to do. We get to eat the leftovers. And so we're sitting up there and uh, listening a little bit, and it just sounded like y'all were just having such a good time. And for those of you that missed it, boy, you want to make sure you're there next year. Uh, I appreciate, so appreciate, all of our ladies that support our ministries here at our church and that care about uh, the work and the ministries that take place here. And we love you and appreciate each and every one of you because it's important. I'll just tell you, it's important. When you're a part of a local church, you support that local church. Amen? And so I appreciate you and appreciate your love, your care, and your consideration of the work that God has given us to do here. And we so appreciate that. And I know you all had a great time. Uh, it was a great ministry, great opportunity to reach out to some folks that uh, were visiting. A great opportunity to have fellowship together. Uh, and I tell you, every ministry in this church uh, is an opportunity for us to serve Him and worship Him all the better. And if we hope to do what God has called us to do, and if we feel called to this church and be a part of this church, we need to be a part of this church, and we need to support the ministries of this church. So I encourage you to continue to do that, and thank you so much for having done that. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. You know, in looking at this passage, it's, in, it's interesting, because Isaiah is prophesying of the coming Messiah. And in prophesying the coming Messiah, uh, what we find in the day of Jesus Christ is this, because what we want to look at today, and by the way, just so you know, the passage today and the, the message today is going to be a little bit more like a Bible study than a preaching message. It's just one of those I want to share with you to say that Jesus that came in the New Testament is indeed the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. He is who He says He is. And He is everything that He needs to be in order to bring to us eternal salvation. During the time of Jesus' birth, here's what we find. We find that the Jews were under the rule of Rome. And King Herod is the king of Judea, which is the area of the land in which that falls. And yet He Himself answers to Caesar of Rome. So He is not... Though his, he is titled king, he is not ultimately in control of all the land. He has a designated portion that has been allotted to him. The Jews are able to establish their own form of government within Jerusalem and within Judea. And in so doing, they were allowed certain privileges in regard to what they could exercise in their beliefs and what they do. And so what happens is, is they could basically set up their own form of government in the matter of Jews, and uh, they could do almost anything. The one thing they could not is exercise the death penalty. They could take that to Rome and say, listen, we think this person deserves to die, and then Rome can make those decisions. But the Sanhedrin is like the main group of the Jews, and it's made up of Jews who act as a ruling council. And they're always under the, the watchful eye of Rome because at, the, at that time, the Jews were always looking for the possibility of an uprising so they could basically just take over. And so in this picture, what we find is they're, uh, though they're under the watch, uh, watchful eye of Rome, they did allow a great deal of, were allowed a great deal of freedom. Now, Herod has ruled that all the Jewish babies under the year, the year of two uh, were to be killed. And the reason being is because he, he knew that the Messiah had come, that he was the one that would be proclaimed the king of the Jews, and he felt threatened by that. And so uh, he made a proclamation that they all be killed. And it's kind of interesting because Daniel, under his prophecies, had made this clear. Listen to what he says. Back in Daniel, back in the Old Testament, 9.25, he says, Know therefore and understand that the going forth of the commandments to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah. The prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. So they understood and knew something about when the Messiah should come. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But what we find is that the time had come for the Messiah to be on the scene. 
All right. And so from the very time back in the days of Nehemiah, back in the days when Artaxerxes gives him the authority to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem from that moment until the moment that we call the triumphant entry where Jesus actually comes into Jerusalem in the New Testament from one moment to the next, we find is a fulfillment of that prophecy. All right, we find 483 weeks of year, or 483 years having taken place in that time. All right, um, now notice that, I mean, this is just a thought. and uh, They would know that the Messiah would probably not really become uh, involved in ministry till he was the age of 30. That was pretty standard. With that having been said, they're going to count back about 30 years, and they're thinking, okay, this is the time. He should be born within about a two-year span here, depending upon how long he's going to live before all this takes place. And so they kind of calculated that and knew that he should come on the scene. And so Herod was threatened by that, and so it was a time of jeopardy in that regard. Now, a lot like the prophecies regarding those of God's covenant with, say, David, or this too here in Isaiah seven fourteen, it is fulfilled, those prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're just going to kind of run a gamut of uh, this little list of prophecies that have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Not going to say a whole lot about them, just going to kind of run a list with you. Now, we're certain that this is a prophecy in regard to Isaiah 7 14 that is a prophecy concerning Jesus. We know that because in Matthew 1, 22 and 23 says this, Now all that was done that it might be full now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now we're going to talk again about this in a moment, but some have questioned for some unknown reason, they've questioned. Uh, a couple of different things in this passage. Number one, why wasn't his name Emmanuel? Why we call him Jesus instead of Emmanuel? Well, it's much like a lot of other passages. For example, in Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder. Listen to this. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Emmanuel would fall into such a list as that as titles rather than a name. It's not his personal name. It is the name given him in the sense that he is Emmanuel. And the word Emmanuel means God with us. So the picture here is this. He's saying when this child comes, when this Messiah comes, you need to know that he is not an ordinary child. This is God who came to live with man. This is God himself. This is God who has manifested himself in the flesh. Not that his name is going to be Emmanuel, but his name will be called Jesus, but Emmanuel is who he is. He's God with us. So that's the picture. Now, there's a second issue with that, and it has to do with the word virgin. And there are some people that think that, well, listen, in the Old Testament, the, uh, the word that they use in the Old Testament um, is a word that can mean either maiden or young lady as well as a virgin. And so they say, well, technically, it doesn't mean that she's a virgin. It means that she is just a young lady. Well, there's a big issue with that. First of all, what we find is when we get into the New Testament, he makes it very clear in uh, Matthew, and we'll see that in a moment, that when he defines that, and he uses that same text, he uses a Greek word because it's written in Greek, that only means virgin, can't mean anything else but virgin. And he does that to let them know that, listen, there's no discrepancy here. There is no issue here. Even if you think maybe it's a young lady instead of a virgin, I got news for you. It's a virgin. All right? She's a virgin. And he makes it very clear in the New Testament, so it cannot be mistaken in the Old. Now, all I want to do is this morning talk about some of these things. And make sure that we understand who Jesus is in our life. Back in the second century, one of our church fathers by the name of Irenaeus, he writes this, just so you know, this is not something new to our generation. It's not something new to our day. This is something that church fathers have preached and taught ever since Jesus Christ. In second century, he wrote this, Wherefore also the Lord himself gave us a sign, in the depth below and in the height above, 
which man did not ask for because he never expected that a virgin could conceive or that it was possible that one remaining a virgin could bring forth a son and that that was thus born should be God with us. Now, church fathers, our early church fathers believed this. All the way from the time of Jesus Christ, the true church and those who truly knew Jesus Christ believed this, held to this, knew this. And so what we find is that we carry on the very same things that the Word of God preaches and teaches that our early church fathers preached and taught. Folks start trying to get away from the things that the Bible teaches, and they fall into error. They fall away from God. They fall into what's called apostasy. My delivery this morning is basically just to proclaim to you and let you know without a shadow of a doubt that, listen, Jesus is the Messiah. He is our Savior. He is our only hope. All right? And that's what we want to take a look at. So let's begin. All right? Um, in Isaiah seven fourteen, we read this. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. By the way, if you're carrying a Bible that says anything but virgin there, throw it in the trash and get you a real Bible. Amen? Because this is absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, truth. It is indeed Jesus Christ, and Mary was a virgin when he was born. Don't let anybody tell you differently. This is fact. The only hope we have is that Jesus Christ is exactly who the prophet said he would be. Now, as we look at this, the first thing I want you to see is he was born of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and David. Now, I'm not going to read this passage because it takes the entire first chapter of Matthew to do that. And I'm not going to take the time to do it. If you want to sit there and read it, you're welcome to do so or go home and read it. But here's what we find. Prophecy tells us that he is going to be born of the seed of Abraham. We also know, in addition to that, he would be born of the seed of Isaac. He would be born of the seed of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. We also know that he would be born of the seed of Judah. We also know that he would be born of the seed of David, and being born of the seed of David, that he would one day sit on the throne of David. So we understand and know that God has made these proclamations and said, listen, if when he is born, none of this is true, then he's not your guy. Then he is not the Savior. He is not the one. And so the first thing that we find is that he was born, according to Matthew, we see in Matthew as we carry out that lineage, that he is of the lineage that he is supposed to be of the lineage of. All right? Now, I know I get my English a little messed up there, but that's all right. All right? Just a lot of bubs in there. That's all. All right? So what we find is in this picture that he is, without a shadow of a doubt, one born as he was supposed to be born to the right people. Now, when you look at this picture, I guess you could sit back and you could say, well, there's a lot of people that would follow that qualification, and there were. It's just one qualification. But I'm just saying, of this particular qualification, he indeed is qualified. But we want to make sure he meets all the other standards. Number two, he was born in Bethlehem. Back in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, we're given this prophecy, But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Mike's pretty specific. Micah's pretty specific. I know him personally. I can call him Mike. All right. <laughs> Micah is really specific about that. And he tells us, listen, he is going to be born in Bethlehem. Now, here's a dilemma. Both Joseph and Mary don't live in Bethlehem. All right. How is he going to be born in Bethlehem if he's going to be born to Mary? Well, it so happens that there is a taxation that only occurs on an occasion. And this taxation brings you back home to have to pay your taxes. Apparently, this is her hometown. She may have owned property there. Her parents may have owned property there. Whatever the case may be, she was required to come back. She and Joseph were required to come back to Jerusalem at just this moment to pay their taxes. Now, in the time they were in, I'm sorry, Bethlehem. In the time that they were in Bethlehem, it just happens that all this occurs when she's ready to give birth. It just so happens that all of this occurs not just as she's pregnant, but at the moment of birth, so that this birth would occur in Bethlehem. So what we find is that the prophecy that God had uh, given us 
false true. Matthew 2, 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. I, this is kind of a neat picture. I, I love when the Bible does this. And by the way, it does this so often. When it talks about God, it just talks as a matter of fact. It doesn't say, now, if God exists or if. It never says that. It just says God. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God and uh, we look at those pictures, and, and we think about that, and we think, well, you know, it's just a matter of fact. God always gives us these things. Says, Listen, it was prophesied, just a matter of fact. So what we find in this picture is kind of cool. There's like never a shadow of a doubt, never even uh, any concern whatsoever. There's not a, hey, oh, wow, can you believe it? He was born in Bethlehem. Who would have figured? It was none of that. He said, he was born in Bethlehem of Judah. Judea. Well, that's because, as a matter of fact, the word said he would. They believed Micah and the prophecies of Micah to be true. They believed it to be an absolute fact. They knew that if it was prophesied and by the inspiration of God, they trusted that. It's just a matter of fact. You know, it's kind of interesting because the things that we believe and the things that we know, we do so just as a matter of fact. I'll just tell you now, salvation, I'm absolutely positively sure of salvation. I know it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. I have no doubt in my mind. You know, I, I don't have to get, you know, all wound up. Oh, wow, can you believe? No, it just is. It's this matter of fact. God sent His only begotten Son. It's a matter of fact. All right? And so His words are true. His prophecies are true. And all that He says will come to pass. It's not up for debate. It's not speculative. It's not theory. It is fact. The only question is whether or not you believe it. So when he says he's going to be born in Bethlehem, it was just a fact. So now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, we knew he was going to be. But when it actually occurred, this is what took place. And I love that when you read the Christmas story in Luke. You know, and, and very often over the Christmas season, you're going to hear somebody read the Christmas story or you're going to sit down and read it to your family or something. And you're going to see those very same things. Everything that's read is just stated as a matter of fact. And this happened, and that happened, and that happened. You know, why would you be so amazed by it? Why would we be so amazed that he was born of a virgin? In fact, when we were told that he was going to be born of a virgin. You know, it's an overwhelming thing. It's something we can't really fathom how these things can come to pass. But listen, he's God. He can do anything he wants. And God said he's going to be born of a virgin. All right? So that's where we see this. We find in, uh, our, in Isaiah 7, 14, our text, we see the prophecy, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, behold, a virgin shall conceive. And then, you know, it's not the birth that's the miracle, by the way, it's the conception. All right? It's the conception that was miraculous. God himself placed that seed in Mary. There was no man involved, it was God. God planted the seed in Mary that she might give birth to this God son. All right. And uh, and again, going back to that that word virgin, you know, there's so many people that get hung up on that and they think, you know what? It's just too, too crazy to think that a virgin would get. But she was probably just a young lady. I want to tell you something. There's an issue with that. Let me read this passage before I do that. Matthew 1, This is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So it leaves absolutely no doubt that the reference is to Isaiah 7, 14. No doubt that they're saying, hey, listen, the prophecy that we knew was going to come to pass back there uh, in, in Isaiah, just so you know, this is him. All right, this is who it is. This is the prophecy being fulfilled, just so you know. Because there are a lot of prophecies that are fulfilled already in Jesus Christ. There are still prophecies yet to be fulfilled. But I find this so interesting, and I share this with my prophecy class at the Institute all the time. And it's this, that listen, every prophecy of the Old Testament has literally been fulfilled. Those that have, are, are to be fulfilled by this day and by this time. They have been fulfilled literally. Now, I say that because there are a lot of folks who have decided that much of Revelation and those kinds of things, that it's symbolic. You know, it's symbolic of this or it's symbolic of that. Well, here's an issue. God didn't do that in the Old Testament. Why does he do that now? Why is it that the 
actual prophecies that were told are going to be fulfilled. Those in Jesus Christ were literally fulfilled. He says that a virgin was going to give birth to this child, and a virgin gave birth to the child. He didn't give us any symbolism in that. He just said, literally, this is what's going to take place, and it did. So what he says is going to take place in the future is going to take place in the future. The things that are still ahead of us is going to take place ahead of us, literally, just like God said they would take place. So get, you know, be careful about what you do when you talk about interpreting Scripture. Don't fall prey to that thing where you start saying, well, I wonder if he's really kind of using some symbolism to say this or to say that. No, he's not. He's literally true unless he tells you differently. So he was born of a virgin. And uh, so he tells us that in Matthew. Now, that having been said, for those who don't find it necessary that she be a virgin, I got to tell you, it's necessary. If there's any doubt of that, if there is any seed of man that would be a part of the Christ child, he could not be the Christ child. If there was the seed of a Roman soldier, which some claim, if there was a seed of Joseph, which some claim, then the problem is, is Jesus would have been born by the seed of man and would have the same sinful flesh that we have. And if he, by nature, is sinful, he cannot die for my sins. When he died, he didn't accomplish anything more than what I could accomplish dead. What made him perfect was that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. He did not carry the seed of man. And so what we find is he was God literally in the flesh. God came to earth, grew up just like a, a, a normal man would grow up, grew up in a home. Mary gave birth, by the way, just like any other woman would give birth. All of that was just like we would expect and he grows up and dies for our sins because he is the perfect man, sinless, absolutely and exactly what he needed to be to be the perfect sacrifice for my sins. i got to tell you, if I'm standing before that courtroom, you've heard me use this illustration, I'm standing before that courtroom, I'm found guilty of my sins. I'm found guilty of a crime, and the judge says, here's a penalty, and he imposes the penalty. And you've often heard me say, and then what the, court, what the judge does is he takes off his robe, and he comes down and stands beside me, being completely and totally innocent, having not committed those crimes, and says, I'll pay the penalty for this man. That's what Jesus does for us. But I'm going to tell you, if he's guilty of crimes as well, if he by nature is a sinner as well, then we'd have to say, you have to pay for your own crimes first. You've got to pay penalties for yours. That would be the problem. I've got to tell you, if Mary was not a virgin, we are not saved. If Mary was not a virgin, we have no sacrifice. If Mary was not a virgin, the Messiah hasn't come. If Mary was not a virgin, we would all be doomed and damned unto hell. Man, live it up, live any way you want, do anything you want because your destiny is sealed and it's not good if Jesus was not born of a virgin. Folks, it's an important issue. And for those who want to fight and who want to claim that, listen, she didn't have to be a virgin, I got news for you, they don't know the same Jesus Christ you and I know because our salvation hinges on him being God in the flesh, perfect an innocent sacrifice for you and I. She has to be that virgin. Well, not only that, but he was born when Daniel said he'd be born. In Daniel's prophecies, here's what we find. Daniel chapter 5, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, he says shall be seven weeks. It's seven weeks of years. All right. And three score and two weeks, all right, 69 weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. What we find is there would be 69 weeks of years, 483 years. 483 years, as I said, from that time that after Babylon had destroyed Jerusalem, taken 
uh, taken the Jews captive. They were in captivity for those 70 years or so. And, and Nehemiah saw the need for Jerusalem to be restored. The temple having already been restored back a little bit earlier uh, by Zerubbabel and by Jeshua. And they came back and they restored the temple. And we find then there is an establishment of the law by Ezra. But the city itself, man, the walls were destroyed. It was full of trash and rubble and it was a mess. People were trying to restore their homes. They went back, were trying to build up homes and and uh, Nehemiah was given word that, man, the place is a mess. You ought to check it out. So he sought Artaxerxes. He was the cupbearer for Artaxerxes. And he went to him and said, can I get permission to go back and rebuild Jerusalem? I need permission. Artaxerxes says, I'll give you permission. Man, it doesn't sound like that big a deal. Okay, Artaxerxes just gives him a decree and says, you can go back. And that to us might not seem like such a big deal, but let me tell you the big deal. It was at that moment that triggered the beginning of 483 years to the Messiah. At that moment, God said, you can count it down. Count down the years and the Messiah will be there. You'll be able to count down the years and you're going to find that he's coming in. Count down the years. And so here's what they had. They had 483 years from the time that that took place until the time that Jesus would enter into Jerusalem riding on that donkey, that triumphant entry. So what we find is this. They knew the prophecies of Daniel. You know the kings that came. I think it's pretty interesting to me. They came from the east. Uh, by the way, it was in the east in Persia that Daniel made those prophecies. You know why they were looking at the stars? You know why they were checking out? They knew the prophecies of Daniel. All those years they had been passed along from father to son, father to son, to look for him in this time. And then here they are in that day and in that time. They're going, you know what? We live in that day. We live in that time. We have a special time and we can check it out. He's coming. We can count it down. We know the days and times. I think it's interesting. There's a lot of places in Scripture where he tells you you can know the days and times. Now, the second coming of Jesus Christ, we're told, we do not know, we cannot know the days or the times. I think that's interesting. Because all the way through Scripture, we're told we can know all these various things, and he withholds this one thing. So today, when we're looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ, we don't know when he's going to come. When they were looking for the first coming, when they were looking for the Messiah to come, man, they could nail it down. 483 years from the time Artaxerxes told me and Maya, go build the walls. And they knew. That's why Herod said, let's kill him by it's two years or under. That's why the kings knew to come to Bethlehem at that time. And by the way, they knew where to come. They knew where to go. Now, they may not have wound up in Bethlehem because by the time they got there, it was a little bit later, they probably, probably went to wherever he was living at the time. But it was likely not Bethlehem. But nonetheless, I'm just saying, here's an issue. All right? So when we're looking at this and we're checking it out, what we find is, listen, when he tells us these things are going to come to pass, they're going to come to pass. The kings from the east knew the time because of the prophecy of Daniel. Herod knew the time because of the kings that had come from the east. He had to be the Messiah to come at this very moment. If he hadn't come at that very moment, he couldn't be the Messiah. That was when God said he was going to come. Here's the fulfillment. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. All right, still under the law. Come out of the woman. The fullness of time. I, I love that picture. He uses the fullness of time every now and then. It's when God's timing is right. When he said it was going to come to pass and it's now time for it to come to pass, he don't say, oh, wait, everything's not just right. I'm going to wait a minute. No. Fullness of time. He sends him. He sends him. Now, by the way, God knows when he's going to send the son. Amen. And in that fullness of time, when it expires, God's going to send him and time's going to be just exactly right and everything's going to be ready. And all the prophecies that we have heard are going to be fulfilled as well. All of those things are going to take place just like it took place at this coming. Well, number five. Just talked about those children being killed, so let me just show you the prophecy on that. Jeremiah 31, 15, Thus saith the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, 
Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Saying they were weeping because children were being killed. Talking about the time that the Messiah would come. And saying, listen, Rachel's children, the seed of her, are going are gonna to be weeping. You know, you find something interesting with that. It refers to, the, to Rachel instead of to the father. I think it's interesting because we know that he's going to be born of an earthly mother but not an earthly father. And so we see kind of a picture even in that. But nonetheless, it's a time when women were going to be weeping because just to make sure that the Messiah is killed off, let's kill all the kids under two years old. Kill them off. Kill all of them. You imagine if somebody decided to come in and, you know, in our nursery and just decide to kill every child in the nursery. Would that be an awful thing? This was what was happening in their day. Herod had them all killed. And, um, and he thought, well, I can do this. And then he being king is never going to come to pass. But here's the thing. You know, we're not going to foil God's plans. He thought by killing Christ it would end the problem. It didn't end the problem. Escalated it. Escalated it. Because he didn't kill him. He still lived. And even the Jews later at the cross of Calvary decides if I kill Jesus Christ, it'll all be over. It'll be done. And all it did was escalate their problems because he needed to die to die for our sins. Here's the fulfillment. Matthew chapter 2, 16 through 18. It says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. All the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Uh, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation, weeping, great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children would not be comforted because they are not. Oh, if there was any confusion about whether or not the passage I already read for you was indeed prophecy here, we find out that it was, and he tells you, this, and this is the point, this is the moment it was fulfilled. It happened. And Herod needed to understand, you're not going to stand against God and win. By the way, if you stand opposed to God today, I don't know about all this Jesus stuff. I don't know about all this God stuff. I don't like all the rules and regulations. I don't like all this. I don't like all that. I got news for you. One day you're going to stand before him. He's the king. He is the Lord. He is the Messiah. One day, it's just a matter of fact, you're going to stand before him, and he's going to pronounce judgment. When he does that, I want to stand before him by the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to stand before him innocent and pure because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, having trusted him and known him. Folks, it is incredibly important that we believe and know that, listen, this Jesus is the Messiah. This Jesus is the Christ. This Jesus is our Savior. This Jesus is the Son of God. This Jesus is our only hope. He is a Lamb of God that died for our sins and made us white and pure, clean. We also know, we talked about this last week, so I just want to mention it and run, but he was preceded by one crying in the wilderness, saying, listen, the spirit of Elijah would come and uh, would be the one crying in the wilderness. Isaiah 40 and 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We found out last week, John the Baptist is the one that fulfilled that. Luke 1, 17, he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, disobedient to the children of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John the Baptist fulfilled that prophecy. So just to let you know, that was fulfilled as well. Number seven. What a cool picture this is. We're told in prophecy that kings would bow before him. I want to give you two illustrations of kings bowing before him. But here's the prophecy in Psalm 72, 10, 11. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba. You know, it's kind of interesting because uh, a lot of times I've heard people say, oh, those are the two, same, those two places are the same. Well, the Bible doesn't say they're the same. They're two separate places, Sheba and Seba. Shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. There's two parts to this. There is the time in the first of those bringing him presents. And then there's a second half of that verse that says, Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. The first fulfillment is when those kings came searching him out. We want to see the babe. We want to see the one that was born. And they brought to him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know the story. 
very often we have our children's plays. We always have three kings come up, and they'll offer up their little, their little gifts. And it's kind of an interesting thing. But we'll also have a second fulfillment of that, and that second fulfillment is later on when Jesus Christ returns again. He'll set up his kingdom, and in setting up this kingdom, what we find is every king, every nation will bow before him. So we see a two-part to this. Here's a fulfillment, and I think this is interesting. By the way, before I hit the fulfillment, did you notice something about the passage we just read? We've always been taught, I guess because there's three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we've always been taught, well, there must have been three kings. It's kind of interesting because the passage we just read kind of tells us different. It says, number one, there were kings from Tarshish and from the Isles. So that's a king from Tarshish and at least one from the Isles. I don't know how many there might have been, but at least one. And then he goes on to say, plural, and plus kings from Sheba and Seba. Now, probably far more than this, but at bare minimum four, because he named four places, didn't he? I don't know how many aisles they were. Good possibility each aisle had their own king. I do not know the answer to that. But here's what I know. He names basically no less than four. So these kings that came, I'm guessing this is a pretty big entourage. This is not three kings that just came all by themselves. If we were to do a, a, a true depiction of this, each of the kings that came probably had a huge entourage. They are not going to travel that distance by themselves. Wild animals, the enemy, they're kings. I got news for you. I can guarantee you they had bodyguards. They had people surrounding them. They had an army that surrounded them. They had confidants. They had people that wanted to see as well. They had family that probably journeyed with them. And that's each king. When they came to see Jesus, we always depict that as three kings. Now, I don't know how many kings, but I'm telling you this. I would dare say that it's not likely that each of those kings brought any less than 100, 200, possibly 1,000 people with them. This was an entourage. This was not something where they slipped in and nobody knew they slipped in, they slipped out. This was something that when they came into town, it's like, what is going on? Man, they shut down the streets. They've got us barricaded in because these are key people that they don't want to be shot and killed. These are people that they don't want to be injured. You know, they're obviously somebody of of some type of prominence because they're making sure that nobody comes around them. All right? So there's the deal. And by the way, you can shoot a bow and arrow just as much as you can shoot it. Just for the record, it was correct. All right? So what we find, I think daughters are only to mess with your head, just for the record. All right? But nonetheless, it was fulfilled when these kings came. Matthew 2, 1 and 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, listen to this, there came wise men from the east to where? Not Bethlehem. Jerusalem. Saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east. Now listen to this. They didn't just come to check him out. They didn't just come and say, hey, is he there? Was he born? They came to worship him. Take a note of that. Kings came to worship him. They didn't come to just see if it was true, to see if it actually happened. They came to worship him. They knew that he was Emmanuel, God with us. Folks, they knew who he was. You know, it's a shame today that so often we forget. They came to worship him. I wonder how many of us truly can say that we worship him, even those of us who are his children, those of us who know him. Do we worship him? Do we honor him? Do we respect him? Do we love him? Do we care for the things that he says and does? Do we cherish his word? Do we cherish all that he has placed in our heart and our life to the point where we worship him? When we sing songs, are we singing them to worship him? Or are we just singing them because we like the song? Or are we just not doing it at all? We just sit and let everybody else sing? Or do we just sing things that, oh, I don't know, I like the words to that one, I like the melody, and so I'm going to sing that one? Or that fit our personality that really doesn't worship Him at all, just worships us? I get sick of songs that worship us, by the way. 
They worshiped him. Here's the key. This is the last one I'm going to give you. He was God. And he dwelt among men. He's God. And he dwelt among men. Here's the prophecy. Plenty of them, but Proverbs 30 and 4. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist, which bound or which hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What's his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Solomon understood something. He understood the Messiah was coming. And he understood that the Messiah would be the Son of God. He understood. He got it. He got it. He's a wise man. He got it. And so he says, listen, who are you? Do you know who God is? Do you know Jesus to be the Son of God? Fulfillment, Matthew 1, 21, 23. She shall bring forth a son, shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted, God with us. Jesus. God with us. God left his throne in heaven. Stepped down and lived among men. Didn't just live among us. It wasn't where he just came so he could get to know us better. It wasn't that. He didn't just come so he could experience what we experience. He didn't just come to show us his power and his might. He didn't just come to brag on himself. He came out of a a loving, merciful, gracious nature that, that only God can possess. That he might die, be sacrificed for our sins. From the moment he came, for that purpose and with that intent, so that you and I could have salvation, that we could live eternally. You know, i got to tell you, the prophecies, these and many more, were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. There should be no doubt. There could be no doubt for someone who is reasonable, sensible, allows God to give them the direction and the light. There could be no doubt. Jesus is our Messiah, only hope of our salvation, and He's God. He's God sent to earth to become man. Folks, if you have any doubt about any of that, if you're wrestling with that in your life, let me tell you, right now would be the time to get it right with him. Right now would be the time to say, God, I believe that. I know that to be true, and I trust that. And just welcome him into your heart, into your life. When I say heart, I'm talking about into the very core of who you are, into your mind, into who you are. Welcome that, God, I need a change. I need to be somebody different than who I am, and I need to know that I have eternity with you. I trust Jesus Christ to be that Messiah and that he died for my sins. Bow your heads with me, if you would. As we prepare for a song of invitation, have you made that decision? You know, we're approaching Christmas and oh man, we celebrate the birth of Jesus. That's okay. But more importantly, understand why he came. Understand why he came. Because we are wretched sinners in need of a Savior. He paid the penalty for each and every one of us. Do you know him? Have you trusted him? If you were to die this very moment, answer me this. If you were to die this very moment, would you awake in hell or would you awake with Jesus Christ? It's as simple as that. Do you know him? Dear Father, I pray that you trust, that you place a trust in our hearts and our lives that this is indeed Jesus and that our only hope is in him. Dear Father, I pray that folks here know you and that every individual, when we walk out of here, I hope and I pray that every person here will trust you and know you and walk away from here trusting you. Lord God, I thank you and I praise you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us if you would.